Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com, on Roku, Dwyer Boxing, and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let me just say, as an aside, news is moving fast this morning. Apparently, it's just been announced that the head of FIFA is stepping down, right? Also, to my surprise, didn't see this coming. Roger Federer, who I thought had a clear path to the finals, just lost to Stan Wawrinka. And it's a little bit surprising because, of course, Federer in head-to-head -head had beaten him something like 16 of 18 times. So, you know, gambling is going to have a bit of a struggle. Also, uh, someone here in the comment section to the video, and this video is really about that comment section. I uh, wanted to know if I was still going against Juventus in Champions League. Uh, that's right. Even here, I'm going against this team. Uh, Juventus beat Real Madrid. Has been a thorn in my side. Nonetheless, I believe Lionel Messi is the best player on the planet. I have to go with Barcelona, the favorite in that finals. Okay, let's talk about boxing. Let's talk about your comments to a video I made yesterday about my belief that Gennady Golovkin beats Carl Frodge if Carl Frodge comes back to fight him. Now let me just say, boxing has a lot of optical illusions involving elite fighters, right? Floyd Mayweather, I believe opponents get in the ring with him. They see that he's about 5'8", right? They know that they likely outweigh Mayweather on fight night because Mayweather actually shows up for fights close to his weigh-in weight, right? And I believe fighter after fighter tries to bum rush him. They believe they can overpower him. They do exactly what you're not supposed to do with Floyd Mayweather. They play into his strength, right? It gives Floyd an opportunity to be on his back foot, to counter to use defense. He doesn't have to go looking for you because you're dumb enough to be right in front of him, playing to his strength, right? You've been fooled by height. You've been fooled by appearance. You've been fooled by a misassessment of your own strengths and weaknesses. Kell Brook, another optical illusion. If you haven't seen this weekend's fight between Kell Brook and Frankie Gavin, and let me say this, I consider Frankie Gavin to be an elite fighter, right? The styles didn't match up here. I didn't make a pre-fight video on this. The styles didn't match up here. Kell Brook is a guy who destroys angles, right? But Kell Brook has a gift where he doesn't look like he's throwing hard punches, Right? His leverage, the way he carries his body, you don't quite realize the force behind his punches. Here he is against one of boxing's better defensive fighters, and I'm aware of the fact that Frankie Gavin got dropped by Leonard Bundu. Okay, fair enough. But I consider Gavin to be one of the sport's better defensive fighters. Gavin's in shape. And Kell Brook looks like he's just tapping Gavin. And Gavin is getting devastated by the punching power, right? It's so bad when they stop the fight, you know, Gavin seems to hold on to the referee, right? You know, no, no objection from Gavin to the stoppage, right? He's done. And it doesn't look like Kell Brook reached back once in that fight. I think Kell Brook's built-in leverage is a big... Uh, optical illusion in the sport. Another is Golovkin. Somebody here in the comment section to the video said, hey, I don't see the link between Andre Durrell and Janady Golovkin. You know, both of these guys, both of these guys really live on spacing, don't they? Right? You know, the thing with boxing is you really can't quantify spacing, can you? Now, Golovkin, I believe the folklore, the illusion, based on Golovkin's 90-plus percent KO ratio, based on dramatic knockouts, right? Ashida, uh, Matthew Macklin, right? You know, guys literally, uh, Rubio, 
guys just crumbling in front of him, right? We see the KO, we look at the time and we see the round, right? Daniel Gill, you know, you're thinking, wow, you know, second round, third round, you know, early. And the reputation is that he's a seek and destroyer, right? That the fight starts and he's hunting you down, right? You know, if you hear the folklore, you almost think he's James Kirkland. He's the opposite of James Kirkland. Don't get me wrong. He's there to KO you, right? You don't knock out nine out of ten opponents by showing up thinking you're going to go the distance. He's there to knock you out. But unlike James Kirkland, who tries to come over to you, who wants to try to muscle you, who wants to try to wrestle with you, who wants to exchange with you up close, Golovkin is, in my eyes, what I call a cautious stalker. In other words, he's not there for, to run for 12 rounds. No one's going to confuse him with that guy. And keep in mind, by the way, if you look up Andre Durrell's KO percentage, you're going to see a high KO percentage there, too. Right? Um, he's not there to dance for 12 rounds. But he's also not there to engage you early. He's outside. Think about an arm's length. Then add a foot. That's where he is. He's typically outside your range. He'll have a high guard. He'll actually come in. He'll have his hands up. Right? Have you touch him a couple of times. Right? But he's not close enough to you. He's outside. He's forcing you to move. He's forcing you to try to come find him, right? Not that he's necessarily backing up. He's maintaining distance by circling you, right? I believe that that's exactly the wrong kind of opponent for a guy who's been out of the ring for a year. I don't care if Carl Frotch has been jogging every day. I don't care if Carl Frotch has been in the gym every day. Right? Understand, Golovkin's a difficult matchup. You're fighting a ghost. He's a KO puncher, but he's not in front of you. Right? He's the guy who's stalking you where he doesn't knock on the front door. Rather, you're, you know, in your house and you look and you notice someone's across the street. That's who he is. The highlights you see, if you look at a highlight reel, you get the wrong impression of him. The highlights that you see are after he's hurt you. Okay, yeah, then he's in your living room, right? If he hits you hard and you're staggered, then he's up close. But he's not up close until he does that. And understand his power travels. It, it's different than most people. In other words, he's reading you, right? He's very adaptive, reactive. He sees an opening, then he's throwing a punch from an odd angle from way outside. Right? He's throwing the punch from a different area code. Then when it hits you, then when you sense his power, that's when he closes the distance. He's not going to do it beforehand. Right? He's not looking to get inside and then engage you. That's not his game. He's looking to hurt you while he's outside. Let me say this too. I believe fighters then sense his power and they make a mistake. In my opinion, the right way to fight Golovkin is how all of these fools try to fight Floyd Mayweather. By coming inside. The way to fight Golovkin is to be Marcus Maidana. Right? It's to come inside. It's to be up on his chest. It's to try to muscle him over by the ropes. Right? Isn't that what they all try with Mayweather? That game plan belongs to this fighter. Golovkin. But that's not how people play it. They sense the power. And then they play into his strength. They go backward. 
right? Daniel Gill senses the power. I'm telling you, Daniel Gill, who I expect to do better than expected against Cotto, right? Daniel Gill is actually a guy who could hover relatively close to you. He takes Golovkin's power, he goes back. Folks, that's the wrong place to be because Golovkin's punches carry, right? Golovkin has what I call ring coverage. So you know the rest. You go backward. You're even more in Golovkin's wheelhouse, right? Golovkin doesn't want you on him. He wants you away from him. Now here's the problem. If I'm Carl Froch and I'm coming back in the game, the best kind of fighter for me to fight is a guy who wants to engage with me. Right? The worst kind of fighter to fight is a guy who's on the outside. Right? Didn't Froch have a problem with Andre Durrell? Let's be real here. He had a problem with Andre Durrell. Frotch isn't the fastest of foot. Now I know, some of you said, what about the Arthur Abraham fight? Didn't Frotch use footwork and angles? Didn't Frotch move around the ring a bit? Didn't he put on a boxing exhibition? All of that's true. But in my opinion, and challenge me on it, it's fair. This is a discussion. Right? Uh, let me say too, let me encourage people. If you're someone who makes videos online and you want that video to be part of the discussion, just go ahead and put a link to it in the comment section of this video. Right? The reason we're all on YouTube is to interact with each other. Let's go ahead and do some interacting. Right? Arthur Abraham, in my opinion, is a potted plant. He doesn't move that well. Let me say this, the blueprint on beating him is actually the Andre Durrell blueprint. Andre Durrell beats Arthur Abraham, right? Doesn't Frotch fight him afterwards? We know Arthur Abraham, at least then, didn't move that well. Even now, I would argue, he doesn't move that well. The optical illusion is people think Golovkin is Arthur Abraham. He's not. He moves very well. He likes to stay far away from you. Now, Abel Sanchez, his trainer, in interviews has said that the fighter he's modeled Golovkin after, and Golovkin's a little bit different than how he was as an amateur. Understand, though, as an amateur, he beats Boutte. He beats Andre Durrell. In other words, he's dealt with length. He's dealt with great jabs. Right? He's dealt with southpaws. Right? But he's a little bit different today. And Sanchez says that he patterned him after Julio Cesar Chavez. Now understand, there's a difference between the two guys. Right? It's underrated, but look at Chavez's head movement. Right? Chavez would come in and he had a little bit of Mike Tyson on him. Right? He would dodge your punches. Then he's throwing shots. Golovkin doesn't move his head that much. That's in part because he's farther away from you than Chavez. Right? Golovkin starts fights. He's way outside, folks. He's way outside. You have to try to find him. He's way outside. Right? And so Golovkin's able to get away with just putting a hand up. He doesn't have to move his head because your jab ends here. His head's over here, right? He doesn't even have to go like this. You don't see him having to put his head on a swivel. He doesn't have to. Now, if I'm advising Carl Frotch, the point I'm making is simply, I'd rather him fight some guy like Mikael Kessler, who's going to duke it out with him, where you understand it's a chess match. That's where Carl Frotch is at his best. Right? Where he's able to touch you with his punches. He's able to hit a jab. He's able to come in with that one-two that he likes so much. That's Carl Frotch at his best. He's tough. He's an excellent chess player. 
right? Take the George Groves fight. You'll notice. You know, Carl Frotch is there. It's when George Groves has no place to go that Carl Frotch is at his best. Right? I wouldn't want him in the ring against a guy who's far away. Especially a guy who can lead with power shots. Right? Someone in the comment section to the earlier video pointed out that Carl Frotch got sloppy. That's why he got decked by George Groves. Well, let's back up the clock. Carl Frotch got decked. He's badly hurt, folks. He got decked by Jermaine Taylor. Now, he survives the round barely. Barely. Had he been decked like that, let's say one minute into the round, I don't think he would have survived. Right? I don't. He's that badly hurt. The point I'm making is the punches that bother Frotch are the punches from guys outside. Right? Who then surprise him with power shots. Up close when he's in the trenches, Frotch can, you know, tighten up and take punches from Mikel Kessler. It's the sudden punches from outside that bother him. Right? And that's Golovkin's bread and butter. Look at these Golovkin fights. Golovkin hits a guy from outside. Right? The guy's a bit staggered. It's like David Hay. Same type thing. Hits a guy from outside. Then Golovkin jumps in. Right? The guy's not expecting it. David Hay Valuev, right? Valuev gets hit. Then you see him stagger. He's not expecting that kind of power from the outside. Look at Golovkin's fights. You're going to see experienced fighters. Guys who've been in dog fights. Marco Antonio Rubio. Matthew Macklin, right? Guys who've been in dog fights. They get hit with Golovkin's power and they look confused. They don't, you know, it's outside their range of understanding that a guy could hit you that hard from distance. Let me say this too. Golovkin is a chess player in that first, he's reading you for the first 30 seconds of fights. Right? He's literally reading you. You'll notice he faints in certain directions to see how you cover. He's hoping to find a weakness so he could jump in. He's not jabbing that much. Right? He's not jabbing that much. Now, why can't guys bum rush Golovkin early? It's because he's far away. Right, so with all due respect to Carl Frotch's boxing ability, as shown in his fight against Arthur Abraham, right? I thought he showed great boxing ability against Andre Ward. Right? I just think this is the wrong matchup. The Carl Frotch who re enters the ring, right, is going to be rusty, Carl Frotch. Look at the guys he's been fighting, folks. Most of these guys are there to fight. I thought Lucien Butte had a clear path to victory. By the way, just like I thought Federer had a clear path at least to the French Open Finals. Well, anyway, I thought Butte had a clear path to victory. Butte gives away his legs in that fight. I'm sure Butte himself would have fought the fight differently. Right? Butte is almost like Ray Leonard in the first Duran fight. Right? He decides he's going to try to outbox Carl Frotch up close. Gives away his legs. Think about the fights that Carl Frotch has had where guys use their legs. I believe the Andre Durrell fight is front and center. Let me say this too. Jean Pascal can actually fight from the outside too. He fought Carl Frotch. Folks, look at that fight. Jean Pascal gives away his legs. He's there duking it out with Carl Frotch. Right? Duking it out in a fight that takes place in Frotch's backyard. So you can't look at Frotch's resume and then say, hey, I know Jean Pascal can be mobile. Hey, you know, Andre Durrell's mobile. You know, um, Lucien Butte's mobile. You can't look at the resume. 
Because of those three guys, only Durrell used his legs against Carl Frotch. Right here, the point I'm making is Frotch would be in the ring with the guy who's using a spatial dynamic that Frotch is unfamiliar with. Understand, too, people think, oh, Frotch is bigger. He's 168. Golovkin is 160. He's small for a middleweight. You know, Golovkin walks around in the 160s. Did you know that? He doesn't walk around in the 150s. He walks around in the 160s. Right? Understand, too, Golovkin trained or has trained with guys like Sergei Kovalev. He knows how 168ers hit. Hell, he knows how 175ers hit. Right? Also, understand, too, many people have made the comment that other men have gained weight and have lost their punching power. That's true. I myself pay close attention to weights. Right? Here, though, you're talking about a guy who's a born puncher. Right? His, his KO ratio is more than 90%. Folks, that places him farther ahead. I would say he's a bigger puncher pound for pound than, let's say, guys like Adrian Broner or Amir Khan, right? People are commenting on the fact that Khan doesn't seem to have the punch that he once did, right? That he did at 140, right? I think it's a mistake to look at a puncher like Golovkin, right? Greater than 90% KO ratio. And then to assume that Carl Frotch would be able to take his power at 168. Right? Carl Frotch couldn't take Jermaine Taylor's power. Wasn't Taylor a middleweight just like Golovkin? Right? Think about it. Didn't Taylor gain weight to fight Frotch? Wasn't Frotch badly hurt on the canvas in that fight? Right? Sudden power will make up, in my opinion, for the difference in size. Right? Let me say this, too. People making the power argument are assuming that Golovkin needs a KO to beat Frotch. Does he? I'll agree Golovkin doesn't have a lot of experience in the later rounds. I'll agree with that. Right? But when's the last Golovkin fight you saw where you thought he was behind on the scorecards? Right? I mean, my point is, wouldn't he be catching Frotch at the right time? Right? After a year out of the ring. Right? If, if George Groves had more common sense and wasn't trying to stand in front of Frotch the first time in a fight he was winning and wasn't trying to hang out along the ropes the second fight in a competitive matchup. Let's say George Groves actually fought Carl Frotch like he fought James DeGale. Do you really think Frotch would have had a chance in that fight? Because we know Groves doesn't do that. Aren't both of those fights competitive? My point is simply this. Golovkin has the kind of long-range power and the kind of movement to give a rusty fighter nightmares, whether he knocks out that rusty fighter or not. Right? Think about Carl Frotch's opponents. Other than Andre Durrell, who has tried to use the entire ring against Carl Frotch? Let me point out, too, that's one of the reasons why I personally feel James DeGale would beat Carl Frotch. Because James DeGale would use the entire ring against Carl Frotch, right? And so, I believe the spacing would give Golovkin the edge. You know, also, people are saying, too, let me address another set of comments. That Golovkin is hittable. I agree. He's hittable. But, there's a counter-argument to this. Right? If I have a bazooka on my shoulder and I know you have 
a water pistol, right? And I have you woozy. I've hit you a few times in a few earlier rounds where you're looking bad, right? Would it be reckless of me to come in and make the decision that I'll allow myself to get hit with your water pistol if in the exchange I can hit you with my bazooka, right? Is Golovkin taking punches from fighters, Zashida, Daniel Gill, Martin Murray, is he taking those punches with the expectation that he'll get the better of the trade? Or, and this might be the truth, or is he defensively limited where when he jumps in he gets hit with clever counters? That's for you to decide, right? That's for you to decide. I, I personally feel Golovkin wasn't prepared for the Gill counter. I'll concede that moment. Right? But my point is simply this. Against Carl Froch, right? don't you think Golovkin would be a little bit more defensively minded than he was against Martin Murray? Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I understand this fight has captured the imagination. Let me also address another comment. Someone said, hey, Dwyer, why are you talking about this matchup when it hasn't been announced yet? Why? Because I'm a fan of the sport. Because I want to talk about provocative fights that are being discussed, that might happen. Right? If people are on the fence, hopefully if we talk about possible matchups and if people are excited about them, maybe that'll convince the fighters to get off the fence to actually make the fight happen. Right? This is how fights get made in boxing. Understand, Golovkin is a king in middleweight. He doesn't need to fight guys outside his weight class. Understand, Carl Froch is a multimillionaire who really is semi-retired right now. He doesn't need to come back to fight some middleweight. How's this fight going to get made? It's going to get made when you and me start talking about it. It's going to be made when the boxing public says, hey guys, how about it? Right? Eddie Hearn has made comments that this fight's a 50-50 proposition, right, of being made. I'm saying, Eddie, understand there are a lot of people out there who want to see it. I make no apologies for pubbing it. Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.